Hello there. I'll be talking for the next few minutes about how to investigate outbreaks in epidemiology. So briefly, the objectives are to define or remind you what an outbreak is, talk about, uh, just briefly review the types of epidemic curves associated with propagated and point source outbreaks. And then what we're going to mostly focus on is identifying and talking through the steps in an outbreak investigation. And part of that involves calculating an attack rate and using that information to identify what might be the cause of the outbreak. So as a reminder, an outbreak really just means that there are more cases than expected in a population of a particular disease over a particular time period. So a synonym for this is an epidemic. Um, and if it's a global one, then we call it a pandemic. So the first step in an outbreak investigation is to actually make sure that you have an outbreak going on. I know that sounds kind of obvious, but sometimes we get clusters of cases or um, sort of a, a, a small group of cases might be an unusual thing for us to see of a particular disease. And so we do want to do some work first to make sure it's actually an outbreak. And we talked last time about some surveillance data sources that might be useful for understanding what the expected level of disease is in a community. It can also be helpful to set an epidemic threshold at the local level. And so that might look something like this, where you have a baseline level of disease that you expect, which on this figure is for pneumonia and influenza, so basically flu surveillance. So looking at what you'd expect and then setting some level above that, whether it's you know maybe two standard deviations above some other uh, measure above that, where you'd start to be concerned that you'd call it an outbreak, call it an epidemic level. So that's step one. Step two is to make sure um, that the diagnosis is correct. So again, a lot of different diseases have overlapping symptoms. And so you want to make sure that all of the people who you are um, lumping together as part of your outbreak are truly cases of the same disease. So testing or retesting whenever possible. We're using other methods to try to rule out potential alternative causes of disease. Um, but you want to make sure that you have a, a tight definition. And so that leads us into number three. If you are confident that you have more cases than expected and that they are all indeed the same um, type of disease, then you can start to build your case definition for the outbreak. And a case definition is really just a way to standardize the identification of cases both within an outbreak and also across outbreaks so you can compare different settings, different populations over time. Um, so they should have person, place, and time characteristics to make it specific to your outbreak. And then there should also be some clinical information and criteria for what counts as a case or not. Um, and it's not really just a binary uh, measure here. Typically, we use different levels of certainty, so suspected cases, we might have probable cases, and then confirmed cases. But what criteria are involved to meet those three different levels depends on the outbreak. Uh, one really useful resource is the Council of State and Territorial Epidemiologists and the CDC have worked together to create some standard case definitions. So if you're ever in practice out in the field, um, you don't have to start from scratch. There are some, there's a starting point for you and then you can just adapt it to fit whatever your specific scenario is. So there's a few examples here in the slides and I won't read through all of them, but again, this first one for pertussis, um, has both those, those symptoms, clinical presentation, but it also has the very specific dates unique to this outbreak, um, you know, place of re residence, the months during the year. And then for the confirmed cases, it tells specifically what type of lab test needs to be done for it to be considered a confirmed case. Similarly, um, there have been changes in the, the case definition of COVID-19 over time as it has evolved. Uh, but I just included these definitions from the end of March of 2020, which was sort of early in the outbreak. Um, so you can see that suspect cases were defined here. There's just a couple of different criteria, but essentially, you know, a certain set of symptoms with or without um, contact with somebody who was confirmed or probable for having COVID-19, and then a probable case is um, the same criteria of the suspect case, but adding on this level where they weren't, be, they weren't able to be tested or that the test came back from the lab as being inconclusive. And then finally, a confirmed case was somebody who had 
uh, a lab confirmed test, regardless of whether or not they had signs and symptoms. Because of course, we know now that a, a substantial proportion of people who are infected are asymptomatic um, with COVID-19. So those are just a few examples of what case definitions might look like. And again, I, I highly recommend you start with the CSTE and CDC guidelines if you're ever building a case definition. Uh, the next step in our outbreak investigation is to find cases and start to record information about them. Um, and steps four and five kind of relate to each other. Step five is to compile the descriptive epidemiology. So you want to make sure that as you're finding cases, you get date of onset, you get symptoms, you get as much as information as you can about what their potential exposures might have been. Um, but just make sure you're, you're doing all of those person, place, and time characteristics. You want some information about the person in terms of their demographics and whether they have other health conditions, those sorts of things as well. So this basic information can help you start to uh, create um, an epidemic curve for the outbreak. And just as a reminder, we talked about this before, but there are two broad categories that you might um, lump outbreaks into. One is a point, point source outbreak, and so that's what's shown here. For a point source, we expect to see a peak in our epidemic curve right around the average incubation period for the disease. Um, so we have one person who got sick in this case and then spread it to other people, and so we start to see the curve getting showing up around the minimum incubation period time. It should start to decline around the maximum incubation period. But in this particular example, there was a little bit more spread. So some of the people in this first group of cases passed it on to others, and then we start to see the, um, the disease die out. So again, point source means that the, everyone was exposed in a single point in time. So you expect that peak to be around the average incubation period. Conversely, a propagated spread, a cop propagated outbreak means that you might are still going to start with an index case, um, but then they spread it to others, and then all of those people spread it to others, and so on. And so you tend to get these smaller curves initially, and then really large spikes thereafter, and, and kind of no end um, or a longer time period until the end of the outbreak, much longer than an average incubation period. So we see that initial peak here, and if it stopped, we would call that point source but then we see another peak at the second incubation period uh, and so on. And so this is clearly multiple cycles of infection that are spreading across a population. So the next thing you wanna do, um, you've got your information together. You wanna to start to develop hypotheses about what might be causing the outbreak and then test those hypotheses. And these two steps you may have to go through a few times if you don't get it right the first time. And one of the more useful ways to do this, especially when there's um, multiple potential exposures, as we often see in foodborne outbreaks, is to calculate an attack rate for different exposures, different food items, and then use those to then calculate a relative risk. So attack rates really are something that are familiar in epidemiology. They're really just incidence rates. So uh, I'm gonna show you an example rather than talk through it more. But let's imagine that we have an assisted living uh, facility with a shared dining room, and this is the menu for a particular um, dinner that was there, that uh, occurred there, and we saw an outbreak of foodborne illness afterwards. So we're trying to figure out what was it, which food item was it that made people sick. And so this is what we would do, um, just make a line listing of all the food items that were available, um, so it's nice in a situation like this where you might have a record um, of the menu. Um, and then we, we create these four columns. And so you want to separate people who ate each food item from people who didn't. So the people who ate the food item were the exposed people. And the people who didn't eat it were the unexposed group. And so within that, we have, for example, 10 people who ate a falafel uh, that was as a sandwich, so on a pita. 10 out of 50 people who ate falafel got sick, and 40 out of 250 people who didn't eat the falafel got sick, and so on. And so that's how we can actually calculate the attack rate. And so again, the attack rate is really just the incidence. So for the exposed group, the people who ate it, it's just 10 out of 50 
or 20% of people who ate the falafel got sick. So we could say our attack rate for the exposed, our attack rate for eating the falafel was 20%. And so we just go down the column and calculate those attack rates for each food item. Um, clearly this one for fruit salad looks a little higher than the other, so that's why I put it in red. So a little over half of people who ate the fruit salad ended up getting sick. Um, but that alone really doesn't tell us the whole story. Again, these are fabricated data, but in the real world, we often end up in a situation where multiple food items um, have a high attack rate, and that could be because people just tended to eat them together. It could be that there's a shared ingredient. So it's important not to just stop there. We want to also calculate the incidence rate in the unexposed. Um, so again, 40 out of 250 people didn't eat the falafel but got sick, and so that's 16%. And now we can start to see, well, 20% of people who ate a falafel got sick, but 16% who didn't eat it also got sick, and those are pretty similar. And so we go back to our handy relative risk measure. And if you divide the two, so the incidence rate in the exposed divided by the incidence rate in the unexposed, you'd have 20 over 16, which is 1.25. So yes, people who ate falafel we're 25% more likely to get sick than people who didn't, but it's pretty close to one. So we're not, we're not terribly concerned at this point about the falafel. So again, you just go down the column, fill all these in, you see Greek salad is a three. So as we've talked about before, that's a pretty strong relative risk. So people who ate Greek salad are three times as likely to get sick as people who didn't. Um, so that might be our cause there. But as we keep going, we see that this fruit salad comes out to a relative risk of 28. And so it's actually not unusual to see really huge relative risks like this in foodborne outbreak situations. Um, so that, that based on that relative risk, we'd say, yeah, fruit salad is probably our culprit. And then we'd wanna start doing some more digging to look at how it was handled, if there's a specific fruit in there that was problematic. Um, you see that we also had apple pie on the menu. so. If there were shared apples between the two based on this, maybe it wasn't the problem. Of course, pie also gets cooked, whereas fruit salad doesn't. So there's a lot of things that we might look at after this. Um, but this could be our hypothesis now that the fruit salad caused it. Uh, high relative risk gives us some quantitative evidence that that may be true. And then we'd want to do some further investigations into the food handling side of things. Um, so the last two steps are to implement control and prevention strategies. So if we know it's the fruit salad, if we know that people were in the kitchen were not washing knives between, let's say there was some sort of um, meat or something else that was served at that dinner, and then they use the same knife to cut fruit, that's clearly uh, a violation of good food practice, food preparation practice, food safety. So we'd wanna address that, or if things weren't held at the right temperature, um, you know, we'd wanna to intervene to address that so it didn't happen again. I do just wanna mention though, that sometimes we can stop outbreaks without knowing exactly what caused it. I think the great classic example is Jon Snow. At the time that he famously broke the pump handle off of the Broad Street pump to stop the cholera outbreak in London, uh, we didn't know that there was this small infectious agent, Vibrio cholera, that was causing people to get sick, but he was able to map the cases of disease, do that descriptive that be work, and link it back to this shared exposure at that water pump. So don't rely too heavily or don't be too concerned if you don't have the tools at your disposal to do a full um, you know, diagnostic investigation or to be able to do really uh, high powered testing. You can still use these epi strategies to identify potential causal agents and then develop an intervention strategy to stop the outbreak. The last thing that we always wanna do is communicate um, the findings. So we wanna tell the public what the source of the outbreak was, let them know when it's over so that they don't have ongoing concern, um, and also help educate them about how they might be able to protect themselves in the future. And certainly we wanna do the same for the systems that are involved with causing the outbreak. So again, if it's a food safety issue, we wanna make sure we address that so that we're not causing um, additional outbreaks in the future. Related to that, I just wanna mention uh, that our legal authority within public health is actually really broad. Um, some of the earliest laws that we have uh, protect the ability of public health professionals and authorities to work in order to protect the health of the public. So this is why we can have laws about 
requiring vaccination to promote herd immunity. It's also why we can require people to isolate and quarantine. Again, with COVID-19, I think these terms are much more familiar to people, although I still hear them used incorrectly sometimes. So isol isolation is when somebody is sick, when they're symptomatic, and they are kept separate from others to prevent the spread of disease. Quarantine is what we experienced in March and April of 2020, uh, which, or what most of us were experiencing, which is when you don't have any symptoms or signs of disease, you are likely to be healthy. Uh, but because of the nature of the spread of disease, everyone is asked to stay away from one another to prevent uh, further, further outbreaks, higher rates of disease. Um, so there are lots of historical examples of why this is challenging and people who had a hard time with it. I think typhoid Mary is probably the most famous one in the U.S. Um, but these measures, again, do fall under the capability of public health to utilize judiciously since people in the public generally don't like them. They do impinge on people's individual liberty, um, but in some cases they're necessary to protect the health of the public and for the public's good. So that's a brief overview of outbreak investigation and the steps that we use to try to identify causal agents um, in infectious disease outbreaks to stop the outbreak. And then again, wrapping up with communicating our findings to prevent more outbreaks in the future and to, to share the information that we've learned.